I don't think Barnabas has ever heard me preach. <laughs> and there's more peanut butter squirts in that jar to keep him occupied. The dog that you are seeing in front of you is not the dog that I have. The dog you are seeing in front of you has gabapentin in him. <sighs> I'm not above drugging my animals. <sighs> Let us pray. Good and gracious God, you created the world and sent your own beloved child to live among us. Made of the same stuff, breathing the same air, marveling at sunrise and sunset just as we do. Help us, Holy One, to participate in the life around and within us as your light and life. God of love and life, restore us to your peace. Renew us through your power and teach us to love all that you have created, especially those creatures far too many of us consider insignificant. Guide us to care for the earth as your gift and our home. Amen. Depending on who is doing the counting, there are at least 20 different creation stories in the Bible. Each one uses metaphors, pictures, and language to help us to grow into an understanding of who we are as God's creatures and how we came to be. Perhaps the most widely recognized creation stories comes from the first two chapters of Genesis. Now, being who we are as people, we often conflate those two stories into one story, but they're really quite different. In Genesis 1, we read the heavens and the earth were a formless void and a wind from God. The Hebrew word is ruha. The wind from God swept over the face of the waters and over the subsequent days, God created day and night, waters and sky, dry land and vegetation of every variety. God created sun and stars, swarms of living creatures of seemingly infinite variety, birds, sea creatures, creeping things, wild animals, and cattle. God created humans in God's own image and gave them stewardship over creation. Not domination, but stewardship. The seventh day was set aside in Genesis 1 as a day of rest. And neither Adam nor Eve are mentioned in Genesis 1. In Genesis, Genesis 2 that Jennifer just read, read, read sorry, um, we are told of the Garden of Eden and a human formed out of the dust of the ground. Eventually a companion for this first person was created. The name Adam means made from earth's mud. The place from the, that the dust came from in this story is never specified, and the Hebrew people are said to believe that the dust came from all over the earth so that no one could say, my ancestor and my homeland is greater than yours. I love the use of the word formed to talk about creation. In my mind's eye, I see the careful work of a potter making an exquisite piece of art. And it is into this earthen vessel God breathed the breath of life. Ruha. What an incredible image of intimacy and love between our creator, and humans. And additional images of creation are found in Proverbs, in a number of the Psalms, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Hosea, Job, and the book of Revelation. There are probably others that I have missed. But for me, the most cosmic and the ethereal account of creation is the story that thrills my imagination the most 
and it's found in our gospel lesson this morning, the first chapter of the Gospel of John. We read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And just like the author of Genesis 1 began their account with the words in the beginning, so does the writer of John's gospel. I think John wants us to understand that Jesus, the word, is part of creation from the beginning of time. Any, before anything else had been created, Jesus was. We are meant to be in awe of God's creation. Every single molecule and atom, every single star, every single mountain and stream, we are meant to be in absolute dumbstruck awe of the complexity of life and the interdependency of all living things. This morning we celebrated our interdependency with our pets. Heaven's sakes, look at that dog. They're beautiful, beautiful animals. Let me tell you a story. When my husband and I lived on the McKinsey River east of Eugene, somehow I got it in my head that I thought I ought to pick a favorite tree. A tree that spoke especially to me and my sense of wonder. Now, I can tell you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's pretty hard to pick one tree out of the Willamette National Forest. But pick one, I did. It was a fallen and decaying log from an ancient Douglas fir. I could not put my arms around this decaying log. It was obvious, based on the fragility of the log, The tree had fallen some time ago, perhaps before I was born. And wrapped around this log and growing on top of it, in it and all around it, was a brand new, well, brand new in tree years, a brand new baby Douglas fir. It's about 30 feet tall. You see, what happens in a healthy forest is that even though trees fall and their trunks are technically in a state of decay, life is abundant and flourishing. The log offers shade to seedlings, nutrients, water, as well as protection from disease to new trees, new plants. Using the last of its decomposing matter to nurture and make way for a younger generation of forest life, I was fascinated by the nooks and the crannies and the holes in the decaying bark of this tree that grew in size, it seemed, as I was watching it. The growing and the eating away of those tree, uh, that tree bark and the tree itself, itself left behind a black, nitrogen-rich organic matter that was busy helping other planets to develop. This dark soil is called hummus, the Latin word for earth or ground, and the root word of the English word for human. A cousin of the name of the author that the author of Genesis 2 gave to Adam. The decaying tree I realized, is my organic cousin. In those tiny ridges and indentations in the old bark, moss grew, and the tree itself teemed with lichens and fungus and tiny little plants. Plants weren't the only ones that benefited from this decaying log and the death of this log. Many animal species, squirrels and chipmunks and mice and voles and birds of all shapes and kinds made the decaying log their home. And the ecosystem continued just as it should. 
I think St. Francis would have been awed by the simple complexity of this forest supporting the lives of spruce and hemlock and mountain ash and fir that lived for centuries in the smallest corner of the universe I was once honored to share. And I think St. Francis would have recognized in my nurse log what I have come to understand. As the seedlings germinated and sprouted on my log, I could see the roots thicken as they crept down over the log, reaching for the soil underneath. I could imagine this long process of fungus feasting on the log, providing even more nutrient-rich sustenance for young plants. I stood in awe of my tree, the way nature became strong, and all parts of the ecosystem flourished in a cycle of life and death, and life again. An ecosystem where everything was a part of the whole and completely codependent on their neighbors. Each and every crumb held enormous value in my forest. It takes several decades for a nurse log to decay completely, at which time we hope, and usually is the case, the seedlings' roots have become strong and thick enough to support themselves. This creative and regenerating process cannot be captured in a TikTok video. And I wouldn't be surprised if my great-grandchildren, they are not born yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if my great-grandchildren would be able to see parts of this log still nourishing life around it. And there you have it. Another life to death to life cycle begins. Since my first Sunday school lessons when I was a short person, I learned this incredible story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for the longest time to me, in my innocent six and seven-year-old brain, it seemed to me that this was just an astonishing story, a fable, a myth. But deep in the forest, St. Francis at my side, I discovered there is indeed life after death after life after death over and over and over and over. Every part of creation matters. Meaning in our lives starts and ends with God's limitless love. And we are reminded over and over again and again, the smallest creation is at least as critical as the most important or the largest of all creatures. With St. Francis as our teacher, we strive to tend to the sick, the smallest, and the most vulnerable among us. We stand behind our beloved companions, our dogs and our kitties and our hamsters and whatever other creatures we have fallen in love with. We stand up against the oppression wherever we encounter it, and too often, it is all around us. Like St. Francis, we work for a peaceful and just world. And we do this all, people of God, in the love we were shown at the font, at the table, and at the cross. All God's people say, Amen.